Hi, this is Professor Romero again. I thought I'd take a minute to introduce this week's topic in week number six, which is to look at the economic and particularly the social conditions of England in the 19th century, what we call the Victorian era. You may ask, why study England? Why not study France, Germany, the United States? And the answer is, as you learned, the last two weeks that the Industrial Revolution began in England, and therefore England was the first place to experience the sort of social horrors of the Industrial Revolution, but also England was the first country to try to regulate unbridled and unregulated capitalism and its detrimental effects and its abuse of workers. Why look at the social customs of this time period and also particularly the role of women? Well, that's really the topic of this uh, introduction. One reason is that the socioeconomic structure throughout most of the 20th century uh, actually developed during the Victorian period in England, um, which was characterized by a time period in which women of the lower classes were expected to work and had to work, and women of the middle and upper classes were expected to become homemakers. And again, just to reiterate that, the Victorian social structure that arose in mid-century of middle-class men going to work and middle-class women staying home continued through the t most of the 20th century, right? Up until the 1980s when significant numbers of women began to enter the workforces in the West. As you learned in the video of pre-industrial society, women had been an integral part of farm life, of agricultural life. A, a farm could not run without an adult woman living there. Uh, and yet by the mid-century of the 20th century, uh, which we most people consider the heyday of the American dream, people in the West came to believe somehow that traditional culture had always been characterized by women not working, men working, and women in sort of a uh, a deeply subservient role. And this, this was viewed as traditional uh, by conservatives in France, Britain, United States, that this was the way things had always been. When in reality, that socioeconomic structure had developed in the 19th century, in the middle of the 19th century, uh, beginning in England, and then um, spreading outwards from theirs. Uh, and, you know, you can see the effect of this that after both world wars, uh, women who had been encouraged to come to the factories to help out in the war effort uh, and prove that they were perfectly capable of doing uh, what was considered men's work, uh, at the end of both world wars, women were fired, right? Uh, and sent back to where they belong, the home, uh, to make room for the returning vets, the men who were the breadwinners, right? Um, and so, again, the, the structure that developed in the mid-19th century continued to dominate in the West socioeconomic and gender roles in terms of work right up through the 1980s and, and in a lot of places beyond that as well. Um, and the other point I would make is that not only did the socioeconomic structure continue of women staying home and, and men going to work, but the cultural norms for gender roles in the Victorian era prevailed at least until the 1960s in the West. Um, all you have to do is watch a few classic Hollywood movies and you'll basically see the gender interactions um, that were current in Victorian days being played out in the 20th century, uh, in the movies of the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s of the 20th century. Um, you know, and watch a couple of clips online. What are you going to see when you look at gender relationships? You will see 
men opening doors for women, tipping their hats to women, uh, pulling chairs out of tables for them and then pushing them gently back in, holding coats for women to put their arms into, giving them an arm in order to climb a staircase. All of these were social norms that had developed in the Victorian era um, in the 1860s, 70s, 80s, uh, for very specific reasons, the most important of which were uh, the dress of the Victorian era. And you'll see this in the PowerPoint that the, the forms of dress for women prohibited any kind of normal movement of the body. And so they became dependent on men and also because women were considered frail in the Victorian era. And so that continued right through the 1950s and 60s in American culture and French culture. Uh, uh, you know, a polite man held the door for a woman. A polite man helped a woman up a step. Um, and by the 1950s and 60s, nobody associated these customs with um, the gender norms of the Victorian era. They just thought this is how it had always been. Um, also, in terms of how women behave, uh, women in the 1940s, 50s, 60s in the West, um, whether it was Britain or the United States, uh, were taught not to raise their voices, uh, never to show anger in public, uh, never ever to use foul language or to tell uh, or even listen to an off-color joke, um, never to contradict their elders and never to contradict men. Um, and again, this lasted right really up until the 21st century. Uh, you'll see in the PowerPoint in the last week of this course, when we look at the modern era, and once again, we'll touch base with gender roles, um, how are female bosses described in the 1990s, the early 2000s, and unfortunately, even today? Um, you know, uh, women bosses tend to be described as pushy, bitchy, catty, manipulative, right? Um, for displaying the same characteristics that a male boss would be praised for, right? And instead of those words, um, you know, the words used for the men are decisive, he shows leadership qualities, uh, he's not manipulative, he's a strategist, um, he's not moody or pushy or bitchy, he's level-headed and cool in a crisis, right? And and there's this disparity between how we see um, the role of men and the, the role of women. And again, all of this goes back to the Victorian age where a woman was taught that at dinner or out in public, she should never discuss anything except the weather um, and, you know, the simple pursuits that she was taught uh, to please uh, men, you know, uh, sewing, croquet, uh, you know, crocheting, uh, dancing, etc. Those were the only acceptable topics. A woman was never to discuss politics or war, um, as you'll see again in the Victorian PowerPoint. Um, and especially when it comes to sexual relations, uh, Victorian attitudes held well into the late 20th century, right? The cult of domesticity basically um, said that men were animalistic creatures who couldn't control their urges, and they were expected to want to have sex and to have multiple partners. Um, and women were absolutely forbidden to have multiple partners or premarital sex. And, um, you know, Victorians divided women basically into two categories, pure women, good women, and fallen women, women who uh, had had a, a child out of wedlock, etc. And of course, one of the things that changes the paradigm is the development of the pill in the 1960s, right? Uh, which frees women from uh, the, the inability to control their own reproductive cycle. We take this time out in this week. Uh, some of it has to do with a pet peeve of mine. And that is that the high school curriculums around the country, teachers teach uh, 
social studies teachers teach the suffragette movement and the struggle for females to get the vote, which of course is, you know, extraordinarily important. Um, you know, Emily Pankhurst in Britain, you know, Susan B. Anthony in, in the United States, I would never take away from the notion that uh, this was an important movement in women's civil rights. But that said, it's an oversimplification of the gradual growth of female rights and equality to, to hone in on the suffragette movement as if that's the only thing that, uh, the only event really movement. That what is most important, in my opinion, is what we call female emancipation. When females, women, began to be considered as persons under the law, okay? This affected women on an absolutely daily basis. Uh, and I'm gonna explain quickly why. PowerPoint goes into much more detail. Um, women in the uh, 19th and early 20th centuries were considered um, in one of two ways by the law. Uh, women were considered either to be chattel, which is uh, a legal phrase that, you know, is hardly used anymore, which means movable property, okay? Um, or they were considered to be children in the eyes of the legal uh, systems of the West, okay? A woman was considered to be a child, an adult woman. So they were subject to the economic and financial control of first their fathers, and then after getting married, they were subject to the financial control of their husbands. Um, they couldn't buy property, they couldn't own a business, they couldn't enter into contracts, okay? And so society made it impossible for women to participate on a regular basis in the business world in any way. Um, and we're not talking about Wall Street, we're talking about any form of occupation, okay? Um, and to me, this is so much more important, female emancipation, the, the, the gradual um, passing of laws that granted females the rights that are necessary to participate in the economy. So before Married Women's Property Acts were passed, i.e. Uh, female emancipation, um, when a woman got married, she lost any right to control the property that was hers prior to marriage. She did not have the right to acquire any property during a marriage, okay? Um, and, you know, we're talking about mostly land and buildings, but also maybe significant purchases. A woman had no right prior to uh, the emancipation laws to, to buy property. Um, a married woman couldn't enter into a contract. Uh, she was not allowed to keep her own uh, wages or uh, rents that she earned if she was running some sort of uh, boarding house. Uh, she wasn't allowed to transfer property. She couldn't sell the property. So, you know, imagine this, you would ha a woman inherits from her father a house um, and gets married. Uh, that house becomes legally her husband's and she's not allowed to transfer it to anybody else, not allowed to sell it. Um, nor could a woman bring a lawsuit, again, because she was a child in the eyes of the law. And this is what stopped women from participating in the economy because um, business, we don't like to think of it this way, but just being a shopkeeper, um, you need to be able to enter into contracts because when I order some sort of supplies that I'm gonna sell off a shelf in my store, in reality, I'm participating in a contract, right? I send money to the supplier, they send me the supplies back, I then sell it, right? Well, all of that rests upon the principle that if I get cheated, um, if, the, if the supplier does not send me what I paid for, um, I can take that person to court, right? And sue them. Um, and it keeps, you know, we don't like to admit this, but it's what keeps people honest, right? Um, the fact that if you don't 
fulfill your contracts, you will be sued. And a woman had no right to A, enter into a contract, as simple as ordering supplies for a, maybe a small shop that she had, and B, she had no right to sue if she was cheated in some way in that process. Now, the first major blow struck in this country is the Married Women's Property Act of New York State. We happen to be in the state that was in the forefront here, uh, which was passed in 1848 um, and was further amended um, in 1860, a second act called uh, the, the Rights and Liabilities of Husbands and Wives, uh, which spelled out the duties of husbands and wives, was passed in 1860. Um, that Those two laws became the model for the rest of the United States. Um, but it took until about 1900 before all, all of the states that were then in the Union to pass similar bills, okay? Um, and even then, uh, women's rights were still limited. Uh, in the UK, the Married Women's Property Act was passed in 1870. Um, in France, in 1881, uh, women were given the right to own their own bank accounts, which is a major step forward. Um, and then 1886, married women were allowed to have their own bank accounts um, and allowed to have it without their husband's permission. Um, we actually didn't follow suit here until the 1960s, um, and the UK not until 1975. So imagine this, you're a full-grown adult woman in 19, you know, in 1963, 1965. If you're married, you can't open a bank account in most states unless your husband signs off on that. Uh, think of how insulting that would be. Um, it wasn't until the 1970s in the United States that a woman could uh, open a line of credit for herself, um, it, it, obtain a credit card or a, a car loan or uh, a second mortgage, etc., without a man to co-sign the application. Um, and it wasn't until as late as the 1980s that courts ruled around the country in various states that... Um, a husband doesn't have the right to take out, say, a second mortgage on his house uh, if the house is held jointly uh, by the man and woman, that he has no right to take out a second mortgage, uh, which might result in the loss of the house without the wife signing uh, the second mortgage. So, you know, that's why we're going to take this time out and look at this. Uh, a lot of times modern female students will ask me, you know, why didn't women just leave home and get a job? Why would they live with these restrictions? Um, and the answer to that is that prior to uh, the First World War, uh, there were very few occupations open to women, nursing, teaching, um, and none of them paid what, what we would call a living wage. None of them paid enough for a woman to set up her own apartment or buy a house, which she couldn't legally do anyway. Women walking around in their 60s and 70s today, um, you know, that I know personally who were told they couldn't go to college in the 1960s by their fathers because women don't need a college education. And they were told that absolutely under no condition, under not any circumstances, could they leave home and set up an apartment without being married. They, they were not going to be allowed to leave their father's home until they were married. Groundbreaking shows of the 1960s and 70s. Uh, you know, the first show to show um, a woman uh, as a career woman and happily working and renting her own par apartment and not seeking a mate uh, was the Mary Tyler Moore show, which began in about 1970, 71. Um, you know, so that's how recent this is, okay? Uh, there was nowhere for a woman to set up an independent life. And, uh, you know, one of the opportunities was that if a woman's husband died, she could open a boarding house. Uh, that was another way of keeping herself afloat. Um, and which also reminds me that uh, an unmarried female in the 1930s or 40s, in order to have a place to live other than her parents' home and say, you know, say she's in her 30s and her parents have died and she has no husband, 
Uh, the only place for her to live is in a boarding house, you know, literally renting a room. And, you know, they provide the meals, um, but they come with an incredible amount of regulations. OK, you, you if you lived in a boarding house, um, you were expected to, to work, obviously. Uh, you were expected to take the communal meals. You were not allowed to have visitors. Um, and if you did have visitors, um, they could only sit in the front parlor with you, you know, with advance notice. And it was frowned upon to have visitors of the opposite sex. And there were uh, curfews. If you didn't make it back to the boarding house by whatever time the curfew was, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night, they locked that door and they weren't going to open it for you. OK, um, and, you know, you can see this in older movies where, you know, the the landlady says to, you know, some young woman, well, you know, I run a respectable business here, meaning you were seen out on the street in the evening with a man unchaperoned. Right. Um, and you can't do that. Uh, you know, uh, women were basically told that they could not keep company with a man um, unchaperoned. So. You know, we have forgotten all of this, uh, what it was like to live in this society, thankfully. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things we'll talk about in the final unit is, uh, you know, how important people like Margaret Sanger were in developing uh, the or pushing for the birth control pill, which is what freed women um, from, uh, you know, not being able to control their reproductive cycle. Right. And it gave young women uh, so many more choices. Margaret Sanger is a, a, a name you won't hear too often in high school because, again, we're afraid to talk about these things these days in high schools. Um, you know, uh, look at what's going on around the country with people showing up at school boards uh, yelling and screaming. So anyway, um, I hope you enjoyed this unit. I hope you'll find it to be an eye opening unit. Um, the feedback I usually get is that this is one of everyone's favorite uh, units and they don't know why it, it, they weren't presented with any of this information prior to this. Take care, thanks a lot.